All right, so we're going to continue on now with all of the various new arrival discs that I've gotten in from uh, pretty much starting from the point in time where I started this video series. And um, I would have just added them in, but I was already kind of underway. And then, of course, more and more discs kept showing up and I kept finding more stuff locally. So um, and since this stuff tend to comes in batches and such, I uh, just decided to just save it all till the end and then just go through kind of section by section uh, like I've done with my regular shelves. So um, that being said, I figured Joel just started off with the uh, uh, kind of groupings of directors and then uh, series, genre types, and then to the main stuff organized by year the way I do the rest of my shelves. So that being said, we're going to start with A, and this is the uh, Columbia TriStar release of Husbands and Wives, the Woody Allen film. I'm not a big Allen fan, and it's been a long while since I've seen this, but I remember the film being being pretty good. Um, and anytime you look at an Allen film, most of the time the sound is going to be mono. He's a big um, sound purist and pretty much stuck with mono for most of his career, um, so that makes the... Uh, PCM really important here since it's very dialogue heavy and you want the audio track to be as uh, clear as possible. Plus, a lot of Allen films are available on nice letterbox laser discs for literally dirt cheap. They're very common. Uh, so I figured why not? The cover looks pretty nice. Uh, it's kind of got a glossy finish to it. And then the rear, it's a standard Columbia disc, so some of the tight face is the same, but you get a really nice amount of liner notes. Uh, of course, being a Columbia disc, that could mean it's a DADC rotter, um, but I haven't seen any rot reports for this one. Anytime I even think about picking up a Columbia disc, even if it's cheap, I try to scan the LDDB really fast just to see if there's any uh, rot reports. And uh, of course, if there's a lot of them, I usually skip it unless it's a rare title. Um, but this one seems pretty good, so when I get a chance to spin it, that should be interesting. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of Allen's back catalog, it's, you know, nice to go back every once in a while and try one here and there. Um, there are some hits and some misses, of course. Um, I've never been as big on Allen as a lot of people are, uh, but I do appreciate that he at least was able to uh, achieve a long-standing career of kind of doing his own thing for a long time. Um, that being said, let's move on. I guess i got a lot of discs to go through. <laughs> Now this one is relatively common and it's not a film I'm at all fond of, but it's one of those laser discs again that you kind of just have to have uh, for several reasons. That of course is the standard letterbox THX mastered release of Titanic, the James Cameron opus that has uh, really, uh, I'll just go right off the bat, I really hate this film. <laughs> um, so why do I have a copy? Well, um, that's a long story, um, but, you know, admittedly, it's it's not as bad as myself and others make out, and yes, it could be a lot worse. And yes, it essentially marries together the Fox costume drama of the same name about the Titanic with the uh, real, more realistic, more grounded British film A Night to Remember. Um, but that being said, it is what it is, and uh, of course, James Cameron has gone back and made tweaks to the various later video issues. So if you go and look at later versions of Titanic, uh, the sound has been remixed, there's been some teal infusion and the color timing's different on the new masters and such. So again, it's a James Cameron film that was a you know really high-end Laserdisc demo title for a lot of people that still has some significance today because he's gone back and changed more stuff because that's just how he is. Anyway, so you, you can actually pick up this as a, you know, it's a common title, but that being said, I don't actually see it around too often. Um, I've spot checked this because, you know, I really not wanting to go back and rewatch the whole thing, but I will at some point uh, just to get the full, you know, experience of the transfer and stuff. Uh, but that being said, it's just a simple gatefold uh, two disc release. Um, nice gatefold though, I must admit, and you do get the simple chapter listings on each side, but it's very, you know, elegantly done. It's one of the better gatefolds out there. You know, not, you know, super special, but it was actually, you know, the, the artwork was well done across the gatefold and the uh, chapter stops are printed in the same kind of gold font that she's on the front cover, so that's a nice touch. And again, it's a nice letterbox master with good detail. 
THX Mastering Stamp. It's pressed by Pioneer and even gets their logo here. Uh, has a uh, matrix encoded Dolby Stereo track and then the Dolby AC3. The AC3 is the way to go. I When I did some quick tests of this disc, I kind of flipped between those two and the AC3 sounds great. So if you're you know, looking for the film on laser disc, you can pick this up for nothing. Um, and it's a nice laser disc without any, uh, you know, later changes that came. However, when you're discussing James Cameron on laser disc, you have to eventually get to the issue of his usage of the Super 35 format for a lot of his films in this era, and his preference for people to watch what was marketed as a director's pan and scan edition, uh, but it was essentially a uh, 133 opened up, uh, carefully matted presentation to give you more picture information on a regular 4.3 television of the era. And uh, they didn't print as many of those. So uh, some of his films came out this way on Laserdisc and they can actually be quite difficult to find. So when a uh, uh, Laserdisc Forever group member said he had some copies of Titanic to get rid of, I figured I might as well eventually get one because he also had the pan and scan, although that's really not the term you should use. I, sh I would say if any release ever deserved to be called open matted, uh, it would be these alternative uh, James Cameron issues. But this is the director's pan and scan or open matted version of Titanic, uh, which just exposes more of what was shot during the Super 35 shoot and uh, is a, you know, properly uh, framed and timed 133 master of the film on Laserdisc. Um, other than that, it seems to be exactly the same. Of course, you lose the letterbox banner across the top, but the gatefold is exactly the same. So, you know, if you aren't paying attention and you manage to find this, because this is actually a lot rarer than the letterbox issue, it can uh, set you back maybe 10 or 15 bucks as opposed to the two or three bucks for the regular one. Um, you know, you might come across this and you might not realize it's not letterbox until you put it in and then go, hey, what's going on? Uh, but if you do that, you're not technically losing anything. You're just gaining more on the top of the bottom. Uh, you might lose a tiny portion on the extreme left and right side, which is typical to happen when you do any sort of uh, opening of the widescreen mat on any transfer. Um, but a lot of people, you know, do make the argument that these 133 or opened up versions of Super 35 films, you know, are important. Um, but really, I think it just, it all depends on what the film was intended for in terms of ratio. Um, you know, there's some films when you open them up that were shot Super 35, you can clearly tell they were never meant to be shown that open. Or, you know, they just had 133 versions made for television and tape and such. Um, but these, you know, they actually took the time to make these separate versions. I don't think they were ever designed to be shown 133, of course, but um, they actually took the time to keep in mind this might happen at some point. So they are nice alternatives, and of course, after this point, they were pretty much kind of dumped. Uh, I think some of them may be made, I don't know, there's so many DVD releases of Titanic. There may be one or two that have this 133 framing, but... Uh, pretty much they eventually died out because 16.9 monitors were becoming more and more popular. Um, but that's Titanic. Same audio tracks and everything, so otherwise it's identical. But it's a nice release to have. Next up we have a Capra title. This is the film Pocketful of Miracles, which of course is a remake of Capra's own uh, 1933 film Lady for a Day. And, uh, you know, it's debatable which version is, you know, artistically superior or just, you know, simply put better. Um, I don't really know that this was a necessary remake, but this was coming towards the tail end of Capper's career. And, um, you know, it does have its own pluses to it. It has its own charms and has a great cast. Um, I was really surprised to find this locally. It's not a common title. Um, it is a letterbox release. I think there was maybe an earlier one that was an old pan and scan disc. Um, so I was just surprised to even find it. It's a nice uh, letterboxed MGM UA release. It has a really nice gatefold that uh, has their typical usage of uh, stills and lobby cards, some with a sort of color tinting. Um, but it uses the space a lot better than most of their gatefolds. Uh, you have the sides broken down. The film runs onto three sides and does include the original trailer, so that's always nice when they're able to find that and put it on there. 
And here is the rest of the overlapping gatefold. Show you the rear cover. Again, typical of how MGM UA did all of these classic releases. And uh, of course, this had just tiptoed over into the 60s. So of course it should and would be letterboxed. But um, pretty much their rear jacket designs didn't change whether the film was letterboxed or not. So if you see a lot of MGM UA discs, you'll start to notice that they start to kind of blend together in terms of the cover art design. Uh, but if you look more closely, each one is individualized enough for the respective films. So that's a nice touch. Uh, you get a PCM mono track, and uh, I can't wait to actually watch this all the way through. It's been a while since I've seen this. Um, I'm much more familiar with the original film, and if you've never seen either, uh, you know, if you're a big capper buff, you should give both a shot. Um, I would say objectively, uh, the original probably is the better film in a number of different ways, but this remake does have a lot of strengths, and it is pretty much near the end of Capper's uh, theatrical uh, feature career, so it is important for that alone. Uh, next up, we have a Coppola title. This is Tucker, the Man in His Dream, uh, which is an interesting picture. I haven't seen it in ages, and uh, it just came out on a really nice-looking Blu-ray with a new HD master that, that uh, all the reviews are pretty good, but um, I, I meant to find the laser disc if I could. A lot of people um, try to find this. It's not super common, and can be a bit more expensive than most discs, um, but it uses the beautiful poster artwork with the typical Paramount letterbox jacket, which I know I've said this a million times, but I still love this design. Um, this is a single disc, so it's not a gatefold, although um, I think it definitely could have had one. Um, but anyway, uh, it's just a really gorgeous looking laser disc jacket. Um, I, I, it's just wonderful to look at. It's a really lovely image from the original poster, and I uh, just love the way it's printed across a uh, disc jacket. The rear is a simple, standard Paramount design. Looks almost like a uh, pan and scan disc. Some nice stills from the film, well printed, uh, with the usual Paramount would either most likely go with the white background, very rarely the black background. Uh, no special features or anything, uh, but it's a nice, good example of what uh, Letterbox Transfer could do for Laserdisc in this era. Has the film's original uh, Dolby Stereo Matrix sound on the PCM track, and of course, this being a Lucasfilm title, it should and does have great sound for the era. Uh, even though this is really more of just a realistic historical period piece drama, um, you know, it does have those occasional moments that kind of have the uh, Lucasfilm Skywalker sound uh, sound signature, which is a nice touch. So, um, you know, if you've never seen the film, or you're a car buff, or you're just determined to see every Coppola film or everything Lucasfilm ever had anything to do with, uh, then I'd recommend it. Um, it's been a while since I've seen it, though, so I, I remember it being much better than I thought it was going to be. Um, but I'm going to have to rewatch it again. Here's a couple of Ford titles. Uh, this one's a little dinged up, but um, I was just happy to find it. This is the older CBS Fox video release of Young Mr. Lincoln. Uh, gorgeous image used of Henry Fonda as, as Lincoln. Unfortunately, this copy's a little dinged up, has a little damage and such. Um, I usually don't go for a lot of these earlier releases, even of classics, uh, but what made me start picking up some of the Fox ones, if you actually find them, because they're usually not super common, is uh, any discs that I find, even uh, especially Hollywood classics, that have a, a digital soundtrack. Uh, usually that means the soundtrack, even if it's mono, which it most likely is, is going to sound really good. And uh, of course, there's a lot of history with uh, even classic titles getting a little bit, and uh, uh, their restorations, the sound department getting a little bit too overzealous in the cleanup process. So anytime I can find a classic title or a great film that has a digital soundtrack on Laserdisc, I try to pick it up just to, you know, even do comparisons. And plus, it's also fun to see, you know, um, direct transfers from back in the day. It's like you're getting to run your own um, art house theater and do actual film programs. And it's just going to be, you know, whatever the studio or distributor sends you a print of. There's no telling what the condition will be like, so on and so forth. 
Um, but Fox seemed to be pretty good about adding digital soundtracks to their classic releases pretty early on. Uh, I think they started at least a couple years before um, MGMUA did, and they were the other big player in getting a lot of their classic library out um, pretty quickly and doing a good number of titles. The rear is standard uh, CBS Fox design. Some nice images from the film, a good amount of text here, and then a little blurb about John Ford, which uh, you could never say enough about John Ford, ever. Um, if you've never seen this film, you should. Um, it, it, it truly is great. Uh, just, like, uh, just like pretty much every Ford film, you can find so much in it. Um, and I can't say enough about it, but it's, it's actually a pretty nice laser disc for being kind of earlier on. I think this was printed sometime... I want to say this was... Oh, no, no, I take that back. This is actually from 1990, so um, I'm excited to actually spin this up. Pretty much the reference grade for this film are the Criterion releases, and the new Blu-ray is, of course, excellent. Um, but I'm interested to see what the transfer on this looks like, just to yeah, have something to compare with. Now, this one I was pretty happy to find. It was a local find for very cheap. It's actually a pretty late release. Um, it actually came out from Warner in 1998. This is the letterbox release of Mr. Roberts. And uh, it was such a late release that the first DVD, which was in a snapper case, is pretty much a port of this Laserdisc. Um, so if you've seen that, you've seen this disc. Of course, since then, it's been kind of remastered and cleaned up a bit. But anytime you find these late uh, Warner releases, it's just really awesome. Um, they're very hard to come by. They can go for a lot of money uh, simply because they're very rare and usually had brand new transfers and uh, sometimes had 5.1 tracks added or special features and such. Um, but it's just really nice to find and it's still in the original shrink wrap. Unfortunately, it's multiple discs crammed into a single thin cardboard sleeve like Warner is very fond of doing. So as you can see, there's some ring wear coming through and there's a little tiny bit of seam tear along all the edges, but that's pretty much gonna happen with any Warner's disc that didn't have a gatefold, which is like about, I'd say 95% of them. Um, but I was just very pleased to find this. Of course, this film was, uh, well, I would say pretty famously, but that would be in uh, film enthusiast circles. Uh, John Ford directed this, but eventually it was taken over by Mervyn Leroy. Uh, it was based on the famous stage play, but um, you know it really wasn't exactly Ford's material. And then he and Henry Fonda had a kind of falling out because they didn't quite see eye to eye. So it's, it's really an interesting film and it has a lot of history behind it. Um, but I've, I've never seen the stage play, so I don't know if it quite measures up to the original play itself. Um, but it's just a really nice laser disc to have. It's got a great transfer, and it has a uh, stereo surround. I, I think this actually does have some sort of AC3. Yes, it does. This does have an AC3 track. I'd forgotten about that. Um, so this was a relatively early stereo title in terms of uh, the era it came out in. I'm sure it probably had a mono version as well. Um, and I think the earlier versions of this on disc and tape were mono. Um, so this is pretty much the first time it was presented in a sort of stereo surround. And they also were nice enough to give it a AC3 5.1 encoding. Of course, you can get on this on the DVD and such and the various reissues since. But uh, again, these really late release laser discs are well made with great transfers. And, you know, is really, again, the last gasp of the format. So this is another Warner title that was so late in the game it was handed over to Image for distribution. You see them on a lot of studio late releases. Uh, it's spread across three sides with a little tiny bit of extras and the theatrical trailer. So a really nice local find of a uh, laser I didn't think I'd ever have. Speaking of that, this is another Warner Brothers late release, another 1998 letterbox reissue. This is of the John Frankenheimer film of Seven Days in May, which is just a absolute fantastic piece of work that more people should know and should be aware of and unfortunately aren't. Uh, if you've ever seen The Manchurian Candidate and were eager for more, uh, this is similar in ways and has this, the added bonus of a great cast and a screenplay by Rod Serling himself. So if any of that sounds enticing, go see this film immediately. Um, of course, Warner Archive has done a beautiful Blu-ray, so that's also available now. 
Um, but this laser disc is excellent. It retains very much of uh, Frankenheimer's love of uh, deep focus, black and white photography. He was very well known for his uh, trademark uh, shots of alternating um, trying to find the best way to put this into words, but he loved to have close-ups in the foreground in extreme focus and then have additional um, close-ups off in the uh, other axis of the frame also in focus. And he was very fond of using black and white. So you get even a lot of this in this film, even though it's a uh, different cast and crew and writer, of course, the Manchurian Candidate. Um, a lot of people group this in with Manchurian Candidate and then uh, Seconds, which came out two years later as sort of a paranoia trilogy, uh, but there are great films in between. And I do think Frankenheimer's back catalog is absolutely neglected. I'd, I'd argue he's probably the most underrated director in American history, along with the other uh, great directors that came out of uh, 50s live television. So again, I can't speak highly, of the, highly enough of this film, and it's a fantastic laser disc. Of course, being a late release, it was essentially ported for the DVD. Um, the DVD is what I had for years, and then I picked up the Blu-ray, and then all of a sudden I found the Laserdisc. It's kind of funny how that goes. So I kind of jumped back and forth, um, but I've seen this film uh, dozens of times. It never gets old. It's a fantastic piece of work. In terms of special features, uh, I think I don't think this has the trailer. I think it's just pretty much a simple movie-only disc. Um, but let's see. I. I think, um, yeah, I know Frankenheimer recorded a commentary on this, but I don't know if it's actually on the Laserdisc. I think it may have been added to the, uh, I know it's on the DVD and the Blu-ray, but I don't think it was actually presented on this Laserdisc. He was actually pretty good about getting commentaries recorded uh, starting in the Laserdisc era. And uh, unfortunately, he died uh, in, in 2002 and was never able to do a commentary for all of his films. Um, but you should listen to those if you ever get the chance because they are essentially a uh, directing master class in a film school in two hours and just a simple two hour listen. Uh, but again, I cannot speak highly enough of this film. It's a fantastic piece of work full of fantastic performances and phenomenal black and white photography. Um, and again, it's one of the great conspiracy thrillers and uh, just a fantastic film. Great laser disc. Uh, the Blu-ray is fantastic, and if you ever get the chance to see it uh, in a theater on a 35 millimeter print, it's phenomenal. Next, we move on to Howard Hawks, and this is the MGM UA remastered edition of the classic Red River. Um, you have to be careful when you're looking at this film on Laserdisc. There's several other releases, and uh, I think the first modern one they did uses the same cover artwork, uh, but you'll want to pick this one up that has a uh, slightly cleaned up and uh, just overall a better transfer. Of course, it has a digital track with the film's original mono. It has a really nice gatefold, too. Instead of doing the color tinting, MGM just, uh, the art department simply went for a more sepia overall look, which blends really well with the choice of uh, background image they used. Uh, the film spread across three sides and uh, it's pretty much just the film only. There's no extras or anything. Um, they could have done that, but they usually didn't really go for a bunch of extras outside of the theatrical trailer unless they were going for a box set. So for MGM, this is one of their better gatefolds, I think. Uh, it just uses the whole space very well, even though it's just a background image and just uh, several things pulled straight from the film. And here's the rear cover. Kind of just a better usage of the um, MGM layout, just really nice stylized font, and it just looks really nice. And of course, it looks and feels like a Western should. Um, I think this is a pretty good cover for this film, and of course, a lot of times films suffer later on from the increasingly poor Photoshop jobs that we get. And I don't know if any genre gets harmed more by bad video covers than Westerns do. Um, but it's, it certainly makes a difference to have a proper cover. Of course, the Criterion release of Red River is excellent. It contains both the uh, theatrical and uh, I believe it's the pre-release version as well, or it's an alternate edit, um, and is loaded with extras. But um, if you're looking for the best version on Laserdisc, it's this remastered MGM version.
Next we move on to Hitchcock and Saboteur, the 1942 masterpiece that I feel is one of his most underrated films. Uh, it's, an, it's another of his uh, innocent wrong man on the run thrillers, but with a uh, wartime uh, bit to it. Uh, in a lot of ways it's very similar to both 39 Steps and Foreign Correspondent. And, uh, but I'd argue it's the first time you really get a sense of Hitchcock in America really trying to understand the American idiom and you really get almost a sense of uh, a bit of a time capsule of how America was in the early 40s and during the uh, wartime climate. There's scenes in the countryside, there's scenes in, on the west coast in the desert and of course scenes in New York on the east coast. So it really is a nice uh, cross-country thriller that also foreshadows what eventually came in North by Northwest. It's a pretty simple Universal Encore Edition disc, but the usage of original poster artwork is really great. Um, although I wish they just used the whole jacket, I don't really need the Encore logo with the sort of light eggshell blue color. I don't know why they did that, but that was their thing at the time. Um, but it fits in with the other Encore Edition discs, and the transfer on this is actually pretty good. Um, the film on home video is always done relatively well um, because it's been a less popular Hitchcock film that wasn't really overplayed like some of the others so it's not as damaged uh, but it's extraordinarily underrated and it's just a fantastic piece of work that's one of those Hitchcock films that uh, is lesser regarded because it had more B and C list level stars and uh, I think it really gains from that because they really give some great performances in the case of Robert Cummings I don't think he was ever better in any other picture than this um, of course they've gone with some of the uh, lobby cards from the film here and if you notice they're sort of the old style of colorized um, uh, lobby still so I don't know if they pulled that directly from that or they colorized it themselves uh, unfortunately it would suggest that this was a colorized transfer but thank goodness this film was never colorized um, unfortunately it is a simple encore edition just has analog sound and as you can see the chapter index is quite hysterical side one is no chapters and side two to get to chapter um, chapter one takes you to the end of the disc where the theatrical trailer is so you do get the theatrical trailer as a bonus on chapter one at the end of side two because why have chapters if you just have one in anyhow it's not really an essential disc if you're trying to you know collect all the best versions of hitchcock films uh, but it is pretty much the only one that saboteur got on home video because Universal has consistently neglected their Hitchcock library ever since the dawn of home video and that still continues on uh, but it's a great film and I wish it was better known and uh, it's actually a really nice laser disc even for this era of you know being still analog only simple transfers next we have another supremely underrated Hitchcock title of course referring to the fantastic I confess this is a really nice Warner Brothers release. Uh, later on in the 90s, they did uh, some of their other Hitchcock held titles and these nicer laser discs with digital sound and nice covers that use some form of original artwork. Uh, unfortunately, um, they're not very easy to come by and can be a little pricey. So I picked this one up for cheap, but as you can see, it's really kind of dinged up. It's got some crumpled corners and such because it's a Warner jacket with discs just shoved in thin cardboard. So it's going to happen. I wish it wasn't because it's actually a really nice usage of uh, stills from the film and it's stylized to a point that you know I think this could easily be a poster for the film. It looks fantastic and uses the uh, original typeface for the film which I'm a huge fan of that being maintained. So other than that it's pretty much a film only transfer. It's got the standard Warner Brothers rear cover but I love the usage of the silver with black and white uh, because it just really looks so much better than how they use that on all their titles. I think the silver should have been used and reserved maybe for black and white classics and then uh, maybe some other color bar used for color films. I don't know. But the usage of the silver and red really looks nice. The film spread across. It's just two sides. It's a single disc. Unfortunately, there's no special features, um, but the transfer is quite excellent. It's far better than how I first saw this film on tape, of course. Um, the PCM mono is excellent. 
Um, of course, the film later came out on DVD with a few extras, and now Warner Archive has put it out on Blu-ray, and it looks fantastic. Um, but any film lover needs to have a copy of this in their collection. Uh, it's a great underrated Hitchcock film with a staggeringly good uh, Montgomery Cliff performance, even though the central conceit of you know a Catholic priest who knows of a murderer and who was told of it in confession and cannot... Uh, tell this to the police even though he himself becomes suspected of that said murder due to his faith uh even though some people have a lot of qualms with that um not necessarily being realistic it's just a fantastic performance and a wonderful forgotten underrated film um again it's it's not perfect but an imperfect hitchcock film is still a, a work of art so again i could talk about some of these films for hours here is the standard MCA Universal release of Rear Window using the Hitchcock silhouette art. And of course, this was the same on VHS and Beta on the original releases. Unfortunately, again, analog only. It's a 133 uh, panning and scanning of the um, original film, although this was not anamorphic or vista vision, so you don't suffer as much from the panning and scanning as you do on some of the later titles. Of course, Rear Window was one of the uh, withheld lost Hitchcock films that uh, was um, unavailable for a good number of years. And then uh, the estate of Hitchcock struck a deal with Universal in 1984 to reissue them. Unfortunately, all the films were very improperly stored and uh, suffered varying degrees of damage. Uh, rear window was severely damaged and had to be uh, restored by the team of Harrison Katz in 2000. And uh, when they went to restore it, it had deteriorated so badly that the yellow layer of the film was almost entirely gone. Um, so that was a very painstaking restoration. And since then, it's been um, put out on Blu-ray and a slightly uh, redone HD master. And all the various versions are good. Um, but when you go back to these older versions, you can kind of see how much more worn they were back then. And you're essentially getting a video copy of the worn prints that circulated back in the 80s. But it's just a joy just to be able to see these again. Uh, so again, no special features, no digital sound. It's simply no frills, very similar to how the Encore editions were. And, uh, you know, this was the same thing used for the tape and beta release. I still have my old tape of this. So... Um, this is partly the way I grew up with it. Um, unfortunately, the later releases of Rear Window still don't quite live up to the Harrison Katz restoration. I was very lucky enough to uh, recently see one of the prints made for that 2000 restoration, which were done during the limited uh, rebirth of Technicolor dye transfer printing. And I'll just go ahead and say you have not seen this film properly until you've seen one of those. They are absolutely gorgeous. And uh, the fact that there's not a uh, 4K disc of rear window out there that is as good as those die transfer restored prints is just a damn shame. Um, it needs to happen. It should happen. And hopefully when uh, the Hitchcock library that Universal has um, is finally deemed okay to be you know, scanned at 4K and properly presented in 4K, uh, we could finally get proper treatment for the uh, Universal Hitchcock Library, which has really languished on home video ever since the uh, tape, beta, and laser disc days. So now we're going to move on to a film that's been treated much better by the studio on video. That is, of course, Psycho. This is the standard MCA release, uh, well, the first major laser release after the Disco Vision version. A Psycho has an interesting technical history on video. Um, of course, now there's been uncovered, well, actually the uncovered's been known for a while, uh, but the alternate version in Germany with a few extra seconds in it, that's now gonna come out on uh, a new Blu-ray issue over there. Uh, but the, ver the thing I like to mention that very few people do is uh, there's actually, uh, I'd say, a good argument for an alternate framing of this film. Of course, very famously, Hitchcock shot it on a low budget with his television crew. The studio didn't want to, uh, you know, finance it. And he specifically wanted it to look and feel like all of these low budget shockers and thrillers that had been uh, coming out and making a killing at the box office on very uh, small budgets. That was part of the charm of even doing this project. Um, and so a lot of 16 millimeter prints and I think even some of the original 35 millimeter prints 
and of course television airings and VHS tape releases and such, and even this laser disc are all in 133, um, just like an episode of Alfred, Hitch Alfred Hitchcock Presents would have been. Um, of course, the film is widescreen and 185 uh, when you see it in most theaters today and on the DVDs and Blu-rays and the... Uh, that pretty much started with the remastered signature box set release of the film on Laserdisc. Um, but I think the aesthetic argument can be made that it does play extremely well in 133 as well as widescreen. Um, this argument was also made for Touch of Evil, which came out two years before and has a lot of things that seem very um, significant and uh, probably preyed on a lot of people's minds when they were at least preparing Psycho. I'm certain Hitchcock had already seen the film because Touch of Evil has a lot of similarities to Psycho. Um, even if you just count the idea of Janet Lee being menaced in a uh, small town out in the middle of nowhere motel that's run by a kind of awkward, gangly uh, young male hotel clerk, shall we say? <laughs> um, but anyway. Uh, the argument has been made for Touch of Evil, and I've seen it shown theatrically in both 185 and 133. And uh, there's a British Blu-ray from the Masters of Cinema series that presents uh, both ratios. Uh, the same thing Criterion did with their release of On the Waterfront on Blu-ray. They presented it in three ratios. Um, but I think Psycho actually works extraordinarily well in 133. I think it works well in widescreen, of course. But I think due to the production, I, I think the 133 version should not be lost to time. Um, of course, the infamous shower sequence, when it's shown in 133, on all the various prints I've seen and TV airings, VHS tapes, and also this release, uh, they actually added matting during uh, a lot of, well, at least certain shots, if not the entire shower sequence. Along the bottom edge of the frame, you'll actually see a black matting bar. I think the idea was that they were trying to prevent any possible nudity from being revealed. Um, not that they're really should be any or is any there um, but it's just kind of funny if you watch this on disc or tape or you see an old print of the film um, as soon as the shower scene comes up you just get a big black matte bar in the bottom sometimes on both top and bottom but usually just in the bottom that just comes up just in case oh no you might see some naughty bits there um, so that is something you will come across if you um, run this laser disc, for example, and uh, you have a TV that you've corrected for a lot of overscan, of course, uh, especially on a CRT. Now, in terms of jacket design, it's the same uh, silhouette design, but as you can see, it has a lot more in terms of the printing. You know, it looks like a nicer jacket. The uh, top is printed in red, as is the title font, and the image from the film is a little bit bigger than some of the others. So I'd say this, this is probably the best of this style of cover. Now, the rear also looks pretty nice, even for this era of MCA Universal Jacket. Uh, you actually have a couple chapters. You get uh, uh, a total of five chapters for the whole film on two sides. It's just a single CLV disc. You do get the original trailer included at the end, which of course this film being the famous Hitchcock walkthrough of the motel set and uh, Bates House set is just you know one of the great trailers, so that's nice that that, that was included. Um, Nice usage of imagery and maintaining the original uh, cast and crew font there, which is nice. So you can tell this is slightly cut above the usual jacket for this era, but unfortunately there's no special features. And uh, there has been some stuff written about the original Disco Vision pressing. Um, if you can manage to get a full amount of sides that aren't rotted, uh, the CAV is better than the CLV, but it's rumored that they use some direct vault elements and that the uh, print transfer is extraordinarily good for the era and also that they used a uh, soundtrack master for the audio so the audio is supposed to be really excellent too so i'm really wanting to find a complete non-rotted disco vision cav psycho just to check for myself uh, there's a handful of disco vision titles i'd like to do that for that are reputed to have um, you know exclusive uh, transfer materials but um, Psycho is usually less common to find on Laserdisc. The Signature Box came out in 95 or so, and usually is quite rare and goes for a lot of money. 
and the features made for that and that transfer were ported for the first DVD pretty much. So you can see that stuff, but getting the Laserdisc with the PCM Mono is, uh, it can get quite pricey. I usually get outbid on eBay auctions. Um, but even this single CLV title, it's I've never seen it locally. It was just a nice local bin find. I was just happy to check it out. And of course, I love the alternate 133 framing. So I, I wanted to compare it to my only other official release, which I have the last uh, VHS release um, from the Hitchcock collection banner. So it's from about 97, 98 or so. And that was the last uh, VHS release of the film. So that was the last time you could officially get the uh, 133 framing. But it certainly looks much better at laser disc resolution, even though this is a much older uh, disc and transfer. So this is a perfectly adequate way of watching the film. It's a nice transfer, even though it's not CAV, it doesn't have digital audio. Um, but it works well. It's much better than the average universal disc of the time. So it's it's nice to find. Um, but you know, of course, the DVDs and Blu-rays are out there. Um, but if you want to see the alternate 133 framing and you don't want to go uh, dig out tapes and watch it in super low resolution and you don't have the luxury of being able to run 16 millimeter and getting an expensive print that's complete or um, running the risk of getting a bunch of rotted disco vision sides, uh, this is the way to go. So um, hopefully you can pick it up and check it out for yourself, see what you think. So next up is a disc that I hadn't originally intended to get, but one popped up locally, and of course the film is a classic, so I couldn't resist. This is the standard remastered release of The African Queen. Uh, from Fox. As you can see, they have their usual uh, logo logos and banners at the bottom. Instead of having the black, blo uh, black bar, they just printed it onto the cover, which I think was quite nice. Of course, the film's not widescreen, um, so I guess that's how they uh, kept their stuff on there, but it's nice to have a cover without the um, black box, you know, just slapped on the bottom. Uh, it's a really nice stylized cover, of course, used for the uh, VHS release um, that I grew up with. That's how I first saw the film. As you can tell, it's pretty much sized for that sort of dimension there. But it looks really nice on the laser disc jacket, and it's a nice glossy jacket too. Um, but it's just a, uh, a single disc in here. Yeah, nothing special. The big box set that this film has, um, it's pretty much this exact same laser disc. Uh, but it's packaged with uh, Catherine, Catherine Hepburn's book, um, which if I remember correctly is titled, you know, um, Making of the African Queen, How I Went to Africa with Bogart Bacall in Houston and Almost Lost My Mind, um, which is a fun, great read. Um, but I already have a copy of that book. I've had it ever since I was a kid. And so um, when I realized that the box set that's usually a lot more expensive and harder to find, is pretty much just the book bundled with the this same standard laser disc. Well, I was like, okay, I'll just go ahead and get the standard one. Um, it's a nice rear cover, some really great liner notes about both John Huston, Bogart, the story, and of course the very rough production of the film. I love the way it's laid out. I like the usage of the green. It kind of makes it look more like uh, again a you know a work of classic literature and a nice new printed edition on the shelf. So it just looks really, really nice. Uh, in terms of the disc itself, it's a really nice transfer. Um, just has the original trailer as a bonus and has the original mono mix and PCM. Uh, since all this, uh, the film, I guess it had some rights trouble because it was unavailable for a good number of years and it never really made it to DVD at all. So you had to go back to either the tape or the laser disc to ever see it. And then finally it was restored for uh, Blu-ray and you can get it on Blu-ray and DVD here. And it's also available in some box sets. But um, if you really want the best version, the British Blu-ray has a better encoding and some more extras and a, uh, a lossless audio track, whereas the US release has a lossy one. Um, so if you want the best overall version, you'll have to go import the uh, British Blu-ray, but that's region locked, so you have to have region-free capability. Uh, but that being said, this is a really solid, nicely packaged laser disc, and it's one of those titles where it's nice to have the box set, um, but uh, you can get the standard one for very little, and if you really want the Katherine Hepburn book, you can pick that up for super cheap as well. Uh, but just a wonderful piece of work, one of those great uh, films that's just, you know, a prime example of the phrase, they don't make them like that anymore. 
Moving on to some new Kubrick titles on Laserdisc. Uh, this, it's not really essential, but I always wanted to check it out just out of curiosity's sake. This is, of course, the original Pan and Scan uh, Universal MCA release of Spartacus that uses original poster artwork on a sort of cream background they were fond of using. Um, it actually looks pretty good for a Laserdisc jacket. They used this for the tape, and I, I don't know if the film came out on beta, but if it had, it would have used this artwork. Um, and even though it's a pan and scan monstrosity of a super technorama film, um, in terms of the actual transfer, um, it's better than I expected. It's certainly sharper than I expected. It's not great by any means, but um, of course it's analog only, but it is stereo encoded. Um, so that is a nice touch. It's just multiple discs shoved in a uh, thin sleeve, but it's, it seems to be a thicker cardstock than those Warner um, jackets. So unlike those Warner uh, later releases, uh, this has not had near the amount of damage that one of those would have, and it's a much older disc, so go figure. Uh, you do get some really nice liner notes here, some nice images from the film, and as you can see, this is pretty much designed for the... Uh, dimensions of a VHS tape box. With that being said, for how Laserdisc was done at this time, I think this was like about maybe 86 or so. Uh, no, 85. So this was before, you know, um, proper film formatting and letterboxing and digital sound was really, you know, put into place as how Laserdisc should be done across the board. Um, so that being said, you know, this was definitely the best the film had looked in the home at the time. It was the best you could do. Uh, but unfortunately, it's a pan and scan mess, and it is the shorter version. Um, the film, of course, was restored in 1991 by Robert Harris, James Katz, and finally restored it to the original 196 uh, premiere roadshow length. Uh, so seeing any of the older versions, it's just really a prime example of how this film really needed to be saved, resuscitated, and brought back to life. Uh, because some of the edits made in this short version are just criminal. Um, this is the version that's missing about 10 or 15 minutes. It's not the super cut down version that was playing in the later 60s in a lot of reissue theaters, uh, but it's still missing some really important, crucial stuff. Um, so this is really for completists only, I would say. Next we come to the MGM letterbox release of Lolita, uh, which is just a beautiful jacket. Um, of course, this is the extraordinarily iconic image that they used for the film's original poster, uh, but MGM UA went for adding this sort of sunburst filter to it, and I have to admit, it really, really works on a Laserdisc jacket. It looks fantastic. Um, of course, you get the usual deluxe letterbox banner, and it has a PCM mono track. <clears throat> PCM mono track. Uh, I picked this one up. It's sealed, but it seems to have... Uh, some, I guess, previously viewed stickers from a Blockbuster, um, but it's sealed, so I don't know if this was just unused stock or they got one and resealed it. I I'm not exactly sure. I've never exactly seen a, uh, a disc from a rental store that's shrink-wrapped and sealed and looks perfect, so that's kind of strange. Um, let me show you the rear cover here. Again, much better usage of the width of a rear jacket. So this is um, a little bit later on in the 90s. I think, think this is about maybe 93 or 94 when MGM started to change things up in their design a little bit and get a little bit better about uh, image placement. There's no special features or anything, and this came after the Criterion release that uh, had a nice spattering of special features and also has an exclusive transfer that uses the multiple aspect ratios uh, very similarly to how they presented Dr. Strangelove. Uh, Dr. Strangelove was also shot in England and is usually presented at 1.66 to 1, uh, but Kubrick preferred some shots being presented in 1 to 3, 3, and so they alternate back and forth, which on a 4 3 television, like a CRT back in the day, uh, is not really super noticeable, so it was probably deemed much easier to the eye. Um, but on a modern display, going between multiple ratios like that would uh, be a bit more jarring. So uh, if I'm understanding correctly, this goes to just a standard 166 transfer uh, for the entirety of the film. Let me peel off this shrink wrap so I can show you the gatefold. If 
I can get it off, that is. It's a struggle of fantastic proportions. There we go. So here we are. They freshly opened gatefold. Here is the MGM collage style with the chapters here. Film spread across three sides with the original trailer at the end, so at least you get that. So you lose all of the special features from the Criterion version. I have to say, even though it's kind of a uh, similar to a lot of other MGM gatefolds, it works and it looks really nice and it gives you a good idea of the film's tone, I think. And of course, this film is extraordinarily underrated. And of course, it gets criticized a lot for losing a lot of Nabokov's book, which, you know, they ran into so many censorship problems. Kubrick famously said later on that had they realized how hard it would be to make the film, they probably would have never made it in the first place. Um, but I really admire it for just the level of deep, scathing social satire. Um, so it, in a lot of ways, the film becomes more of just a bitter black comedy that kind of foreshadows a lot of stuff that would come up two years later in Dr. Strangelove. Um, if you've never seen it, you absolutely need to. Uh, Warner Brothers has a nice Blu-ray out right now, so you can also pick that up um, if you don't have the laser disc. And the Criterion release, I hope to find someday. I'd love to just see the exclusive features and transfer and stuff, but that's pretty hard to come by and can get quite pricey. So continuing on, this is a release I wanted for a long time uh, and finally managed to find at a very nice price with the sequel. This is, of course, the final MGM release of 2001 A Space Odyssey on Laserdisc, and it uses the exact same cover and gatefold and everything as the original uh, MGM letterbox release from about 92 or 91 or so. Uh, of course, this basically just takes the... Uh, refresh transfer for the big CAV 25th anniversary box set and just places it on a movie only CLV reissue. This disc was manufactured in about 1998 or so. Of course the big addition is the Dolby Digital AC3 5.1 encoding of the film's original 1968 mix uh, which after this release and the uh, subsequent MGM first DVD release of this film which was a port of this particular laser disc um, Warner Brothers took over the film and remixed the film with a new 5.1 track uh, that kind of changes the dynamic range a little bit and uh, there's a couple little differences here and there that are very minor but uh, ever since then the film's original mix has been missing on home video until the recent 4k release finally restored it. So for a long time this Laserdisc and that first DVD were the only way to hear the film's original mix in 5.1 discrete. So that's what made this very important. Uh, pretty much you lose all the extras and everything from the box set, uh, but you get the final 1998 pressing with AC3. Um, and the only way to tell is this tiny little Dolby Digital imprinted mark here. It's not actually a sticker, it's imprinted on here like MGM did with most of these reissues. They just use the original disc jacket and uh, literally just reprint it and slap a Dolby sticker on it somewhere. So here is the gatefold, and as you can see, it's the same as the original, but seeing as this disc was pressed in 1998, everything's a lot smoother, a lot cleaner, the printing's a little better, and of course it doesn't have as much accumulated dust and wear and tear on it. And of course, still spread across three sides, and they at least give you the original trailer, so that's nice. Um, but again, if you want the MGM features, you'll have to either get uh, the DVD, which has some, or their uh, 25th anniversary CAV box, which is quite nice. Or, of course, the Criterion has separate special features that are exclusive to that. And, of course, there's all of the features on the later Warner Brothers releases. Show you the rear. Again, exactly the same as the original letterbox release. And the Dolby sticker logo has always already been added here as well. And again, the printing's a little better, it's a little sharper, less wear and tear, but otherwise it looks identical. So it's very confusing, and if you're going to try to track down this pressing, you're going to have to really scrutinize, especially online. Uh, again, the only surefire way to tell is to find that Dolby logo on there somewhere, or to be able to check the catalog numbers. 
very pleased to find this one. I'd wanted to find it for a long time, um, but I found the DVD first and I've compared the two and it is the same 5.1 track. Um, of course, you can now get the film's original mix on the 4K release, so that is really good of Warner Brothers to finally fix that. Um, but anyway, if you want the best version on Laserdisc in terms of uh, picture and sound, uh, this is going to come pretty close. Um, in terms of sound, it's as good as it gets. Uh, the digital Matrix surround track also sounds excellent, and that's what we had up until this point. And this gives you the bonus of having AC3. Um, of course, it's not quite as good as the CAV MGM box set, uh, but if you're not going to split hairs between CLV and CAV, then you'll do fine with this if this is what you're wanting. Very, very difficult to find. Later, this MGM AC3 reissue. Very hard to find in the ship. Yes, very difficult. This one was a pretty recent find and I was very pleased to actually be able to pick it up. It's not very common. This is the noir classic, The Big Heat, the Fritz Lang film from 1953. And it is a image classics release. So you get their typical uh, banner with the laser disc background and then the uh, artwork obviously designed for tape and beta. But I must admit this covered, you know, the image they chose and the way they stylized it, it looks pretty nice. Um, of course, this is an iconic noir, and uh, I don't know why, but most of the covers for the film, especially some of the later ones, just don't really do it justice, but um, I must admit this does look pretty good. Uh, the reason I picked this up, of course, is because it does have a digital PCM track, so I'm going to be very curious to fire this up and check it out and can see how it stacks up against the later restored versions and the uh, Twilight Time Blu-ray, for example. Uh, again, pretty much the same uh, way you're going to see every image jacket. Of course, licensed from the Columbia Library, so you get the old RCA Columbia logo there. Uh, and this is pretty common with a lot of image discs from this time period. They have an actual paper sticker on here uh, telling you the discs are made in Japan and the jackets printed in the States. So, um, But again, excited to fire this up and see what it looks like. Um, of course, with image discs, sometimes their classics can you know, occasionally you're going to run across a few that have, uh, they're, they're not really rotter titles, but some of these discs I found, you know, you can run into some rot here and there. Um, so, but that's not, that's not across the board. That's every once in a while. Some like Journey into Fear, your um, most copies at least have some speckling here and there. Um, so that is something to keep in mind. But anytime you can find some of these classics that are, you know, um, older and not not too readily available, particularly with digital soundtracks, because not all of them got digital tracks. It's just a really, really um, a, a nice find, a nice random find in a local bin. Now this was just a random pickup. I saw it included in uh, some discs the seller was uh, getting rid of, and I just had to try it out. This is the Japanese 1993 letterbox pressing of The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Uh, this is basically identical to um, what you got in the uh, Clint Eastwood trilogy box set over here and the standard GBU uh, US letterbox release. Uh, this is of course just the Japanese version pressed about uh, two years later uh, using a different setup of artwork and as you, you can pretty much tell this is the art that was later um, slightly modified and used on all the 1998 releases, um, which is, of course, when that slightly different edit of the film first appeared and uh, had the additional Italian scenes uh, first presented to U.S. audiences, uh, of course, just subtitled in, in English with the original Italian mono. So, and it still has the Obi strip, so I'll give you a close-up of that here. So again, it's the same master and transfer as the US disc, so it's pretty much CLV with PCM mono, and this is the only way to actually be able to see the original uh, international edit of the film. Uh, the 1998 versions have uh, a few slight differences in the edit. Why that happens, nobody knows. I assume they just started using a... Uh, they kind of would cobble together different print sources to try to make one really clean overall print. So they maybe found a different source print or um, 
uh, alternate release print or something and just kind of made a new version without realizing that there were slight differentiations. Uh, and of course, this master on all of the discs and tapes that used it, uh, pretty infamously, every time the film freezes and gives you the character name captions, uh, this source print, those pop up in Italian. So uh, if you have a version on Laserdisc and you have no idea what I'm talking about and you're wondering which edition you have technically, uh, if you're watching the film, anytime it pauses and gives the character captions, uh, you have the older disc with the correct edit if they're in Italian. So it's it's not something wrong with your player, it's just the fact that they used a source print that uh, still had the Italian captions. I do like how they uh, part, pour, uh, I like how they portion this off, uh, even though again it's pretty much lined up for tape dimensions. They kind of gave it a torn poster look, which is nice, and this sort of like gray green background. I, I even like the stylized Japanese writing in there. It just looks really, really nice. The gatefold is pretty standard, but I do like the usage of original elements from the poster there against a yellow background. That, that kind of does really work. Of course, I wish the text was in English and not Japanese, but you know. And here is a mixture of actual film stills and then on set foot uh, stills, which is kind of nice. Uh, you kind of get a different mix of things. Um, but it, it looks pretty good, and you have a couple bullet holes here. Um, the rest of the yellow background is a little bit bare, but pretty darn good for an MGM disc. Now the rear cover is excellent. Uh, you have the typical Japanese block with information there on the bottom. and beautiful usage of imagery again on this kind of green background the title going sideways it looks fantastic and I wish this jacket had been used over here it would have looked a lot better um, they could have just kept this for the 98 disc if they wanted to but of course they didn't um, so anyway it's a really nice jacket and it was a really nice find to be able to pick this up but it is essentially the same as the US disc um, so if you're looking to see the most authentic, correct version of the film on video, uh, you're going to have to track down the U.S. letterbox version or the uh, Clint Eastwood trilogy box set with all three or uh, this Japanese pressing if you just like Japanese discs a whole lot. Otherwise, it's identical. Um, and again, the 98 version is great and it's what I grew up with, uh, but there are a few minute different uh, edits in there that make it slightly different to uh, this version, which is what was seen on all the international circuits in 1966 and 67. So this is what you would have seen on the original US 67 release as well. So really nice disc, not exactly essential, but uh, just always nice to be able to look at some of these Japanese import versions. Next up is the 1976 classic Network, directed by Sidney Lumet. Um, of course, this film really needs no introduction. It got several releases on Laserdisc. Uh, this was the first, you know, really decent one. Uh, it, it was the first with digital sound and is actually a uh, 133 transfer. It's not pan and scan. Uh, it's it's essentially an open mat job, um, but it, it but it's not really essential, and you really should always view the film in widescreen. But um, I was determined to just look at some of the different versions, seeing as the uh, U.S. Blu-ray looks different from the Arrow U.K. Blu-ray because it's a different transfer. And uh, anytime I can look at a different version of one of my favorite films or a really great film, uh, I get really interested. So um, I first had the old MGM version, the first Laserdisc release, but that was super rotted. And that's pretty much a rotter across the board. Um, this basically takes that old transfer and it like spruces it up a lot. That old one was really smeary and kind of indistinct, but you know, still good for the time if it wasn't rotted to death. Um, this gives it more sides and uh, has better side breaks and has a uh, PCM mono track, which sounds great, and the transfer is a lot sharper. And it's interesting seeing the film in 133 as opposed to widescreen. So if you're interested and this pops up, it's definitely a nicer MGM disc. As you can see, it gets a nice gatefold with the award blurbage. And of course, just a lovely entire panel shot there. And over here, 
you have some nice stills and a side panel shot. So as you can see, this was MGM actually doing a bit more with the gatefold, which they seem to want to do when it was a more well-respected title, um, at least by critical and public establishment uh, places, so on and so forth. So a pretty nice gatefold. I just wish it was letterboxed. Now the rear is kind of the older design of MGM jackets. Uh, they had this design more on uh, older discs that were still analog only, but you can see some things kind of held over for a while. Um, but still, you know, it's, it's a nice jacket. It's very stylized and fits with the film perfectly. Uh, again, this was the first time that you really had a good transfer on any format. And this was used on all the tapes and such. Uh, later on, it did get a letterbox release pretty late in the game, and then that was ported to an early DVD. And then uh, eventually that was superseded by a special edition master on DVD with a bunch of new extras, and then that got ported to Blu-ray. So you can pick up the Blu-ray for very cheap. If you've never seen the film, you owe it to yourself to see it. Uh, and it's an indictment of television and mass media that was uh, you know, decades ahead of its time, even in the 70s. But um, just one of those great uh, films that is not only a time capsule of its period, but still can say a lot about today. Um, and it's actually a pretty nice disc, even though unfortunately it is a uh, 133 opened up version instead of a letterbox transfer. But if you're going for this film on Laserdisc, you pretty much need to only look at this version or the letterbox version because the earlier one is really soft and very rotty. <laughs> Now this next one is is not one I was really a big fan of, and I don't I don't know that a lot of people are as well. But um, when this CAV version popped up, I just had to go for it. I'm of course, talking about Spielberg's version of the color purple. This is the Warner Brothers CAV full feature version. Uh, this and Empire of the Sun got. Uh, CAV versions and I'd love to have the CAV Empire of the Sun because I think that's a great underrated film um, but it's been a long time since I've seen this and I kind of wanted to go back and give it another shot um, especially after all this time and this CAV version popped up locally and most of the time you just come across the standard CLV version and it's a much longer film so you're going to run into a lot of long sides and it being kind of an older disc and especially for Warner Brothers uh, you know every bit of extra video quality you can eke out is going to at least help and not make it such a strain on your eyes <laughs> um, but anyway you have the original artwork here uh, sized down obviously for tape dimensions and has a closed captioning mark on there um, I don't know why that would be there instead of somewhere else but anyway uh, and then Warner gave it this sort of white I guess prestigious looking cover but essentially it just uh, encodes the film in CIV instead of CLV unfortunately they just put all these extra discs in just a single non padded thin cardboard sleeve so if you're gonna pick one of these up it's most likely gonna be split all over the seams and full of ring wear and this one's held up pretty well. I don't think it's been, uh, you know, taken off the shelf that much. That was another reason why I picked it up. Uh, because it's CAV, it's spread out on two six sides. Uh, there's no real special features or anything, uh, of course, but it is letterboxed and it does have a digital Dolby Surround encoded soundtrack. So um, it's going to be better than the standard release and that's about it. Um, but it is nice to see at least a nice white background instead of the usual Warner Brothers black and whatever color they put over here. And I don't think they did this too many times with a lot of laser discs. I think it was only, only really a handful. I can't even remember some of the others off the top of my head. So I guess it was nice they did it for films they felt deserved it. So if you're looking for this film on laser disc. I'd recommend, you know, spend a couple extra bucks and get the CAV version uh, just because, you know, Warner Brothers discs of this era are only going to be so good in the video department and, you know, every little bit of extra quality you can get is just going to help, so. Next up is the deluxe widescreen version of Hook. Of course, this title is a pretty well-known rotter and I had not 
intended on picking this up because I'm not a fan of you know playing the rot lottery all the time. Uh, but this this copy is almost in perfect shape. He has a little saw cut on it, but it's not too bad. Everything else is perfect, and the cover looks excellent with this sort of stylized old treasure map design. And it was literally like a quarter, so <laughs> I figured I'll I'll give it a shot because again I haven't seen this film in ages. The gatefold is also very, very well done. You get both uh, a little text about the film, but it's mostly all behind the scenes stuff about the crew, actors, sets, stunts, and the overall film itself. So just a really nice piece. And of course, any time that somebody actually uses the gatefold accurately and doesn't leave a lot of dead space, I get really happy. <laughs> um, because not everybody did that, of course. If you've been watching all of these videos, it becomes quickly apparent that uh, the art of proper gatefold usage was not really taught to everyone. <laughs> Here's the rear. I'm gonna kick it up a bit. Let me pull that down so it doesn't glare. Again, keeping with the texture design, the film spread across onto three sides with no special features and has a digital Dolby Surround encoded soundtrack. Um, of course, the sound is going to be excellent across the board because this is one of the few films that was uh, designed around the uh, CDS system back in the early 90s, but I don't know if it ever played that way. Uh, I think if I recall correctly, Spielberg heard a uh, or was seeing one of the CDS demos and uh, the sound cut out. And of course, when the sound cut out, uh, cuts out on during the CDS process, there was no room for a backup track, so you lost the audio entirely. And uh, the rumor goes that he swore that off, and that's why he wound up backing the DTS system on Jurassic Park, which is the film that premiered DTS theatrically. So anyway, uh, the film is mixed exceptionally well and sounds great. Um, I've done a quick sampling of this, and it didn't look like it had any rot, but I'm just going to have to watch the whole disc all the way through and uh, hopefully it doesn't get to a complete uh, you know, point of uh, total rot. Um, I think it's kind of one of those where people either have a disc with some speckling, or they get lucky and it's fine, or they have one that's just totally dead. So uh, do keep that in mind if you're interested in this film on Laserdisc. Next up is the RKO film Quality Street from 1937. Uh, this is directed by George Stevens and is a, an early Katherine Hepburn film. And I've kind of been on a sort of uh, Katherine Hepburn bench for a while. So I was happy to find yet another RKO Classic Collection disc um, that was a film I'd been meaning to see. And I've also been trying to bone up on a lot of uh, George Stevens' work. So I'm excited to finally be able to see this. And I don't think it has, uh, I think it came out on DVD at some point, but it, I think you have to track it down online. It does have a digital PCM track, so that's nice. And just anytime you can find any of these old RKO discs, it's just a really, really nice thrill. And, you know, one day I'd love to have all of them because a good number of these still have never made it to DVD. There's actually a, a surprising amount that haven't, and there's no reason why they shouldn't. And then some of the ones that did make it to DVD or later Laserdisc uh, have gone out of print. So um, again, pretty standardized, just like a lot of other RKO discs. You have the little manufactured in Japan and jacket printed in USA sticker. Um, but yeah, I'll be excited to finally be able to see this. And again, anytime I come across an RKO disc, it's like just an instant buy for me. Next up is the Truffaut picture, Brideboard Black. This is the MGMUA Deluxe Letterbox reissue. And uh, again, this was pretty much the first time that the film was presented letterboxed. And uh, it was a nice pressing from about, I think, the mid 90s or so. Not too common. And was pretty much ported for the MGM Letterbox DVD. Unfortunately, I think Truffaut's entire body of work is not discussed uh, often enough. And especially a lot of his later films and the non. Uh, Antoine Doignel films uh, are really just kind of uh, 
you know, they get name checked every once in a while and some people may really like one or two, but otherwise they kind of just get, you know, kind of shuffled to the side and forgotten about. And it's really a shame because he really did have a very interesting body of work if you follow his entire career um, before his untimely death. Uh, and this is a really interesting picture. Of course, it's based on the William Irish book. So it's basically Truffaut making a French film based on a work of, you know, classic hard-boiled noir writing. So it's really interesting to see how that translates between, of course, English, well, the English idiom and the American idiom over to France in 1968. So it's an interesting film. It's very well made. And of course, if you've ever seen any Truffaut film, you know, they, they always have a lot of substance to them. Uh, pretty simple MGM jacket, single disc with two sides. Does include the original trailer, but that's pretty much it. Um, it's subtitled in English, of course, so you will have the um, subtitles. I would suppose they're in the litter boxing, um, but I don't know for certain. I've got to spin this up yet. And it's pretty much going to be identical to what is on the uh, standard MGM DVD. Um, I know some of the Truffaut films have been restored uh, in various countries. I think uh, there's some extra, um, I think there's some good restored Blu-rays out in uh, France, of course, and in Europe that are available. And Criterion's done a number over here, but um, there are some titles that are already available over in Europe that haven't uh, come out in HD over here yet. So uh, if you're interested in like, uh, you know, going further into Truffaut's uh, catalog or uh, you know in HD versions you might want to check out some of those but uh, really interesting film and really happy to find the laser discovered. Continuing on with another Truffaut film this is the MGM UA release of the story of Adele Age uh, which is an interesting picture of course it's a historical drama uh, unfortunately this is a 133 presentation um, which I haven't seen the film in ages but I would have thought it was widescreen, but I can't remember for certain. Um, and I haven't spun this up yet, but I would assume it's kind of an open matting of the uh, original. It does have, of course, English subtitles, so those will appear at the bottom of the frame. It has a PCM mono track, and uh, of course there were earlier versions, so this was, you know, the first that had, you know, a digital video transfer, was kind of cleaned up and such, and would have been ported for the DVD version. Uh, but again, I don't know why it's uh, not letterboxed, but again, I'd have to uh, go and compare all the different versions just to figure out exactly why and to see if it is indeed open matted. Again, I was just happy to find one of these Truffaut laser discs, so I, I just picked it up automatically without even realizing. Um, but again, that's just one of those things. Sometimes you come across a film and it's just... 133 on Laserdisc instead of being widescreen because who knows. Um, but anyway, it's a nice stylized cover. Again, MGM had gotten much better at using you know, their choice of colored still. And I like how the text has sort of an uh, old printing style of the uh, uh, opening uh, letter of the text that makes it feel very old world and the uh, stylized font here for the character names and for the uh, title blurb up here. It's just a nice little touch. Uh, films on two sides on a single disc, no trailer or anything, but uh, at this point in time, this film was not very easy to see in this state. So uh, like pretty much all of the later Truffaut films. So just nice to find. And uh, it's now one of several Truffaut laser discs that I've managed to pick up here and there. And a lot of times these laser discs that were ported for those MGM DVDs we were stuck with for years, they can be um, sometimes a little bit nicer to look at because they don't have all of the uh, digital noise and such that came from early DVDs. Next up is the Classic Noir directed by Robert Wise, The Setup, also an RKO Classic Collection disc, um, a really nice find. This is a great noir. Uh, if you've never seen it or if you're a fan of boxing films, it's one of the great films about boxing, period. Um, really nice glossy printing on this jacket too. Um, not all the RKO discs have glossy printing, so this is one that looks really nice. Of course, it has a digital PCM mono track, and the rear is pretty much the same as the rest, and the manufacturing sticker is down here. 
But still, just a nice find, and I always enjoy going back and revisiting any of the classic noirs, and uh, especially getting to see what they were like on Laserdisc, and you know, see if the like uh, print used for the transfer is any different, or if it has uh, real Q changeover marks and things like that. Uh, so you you never know what's going to come up, and it's like being able to see a print of whatever gets sent out to an uh, art house or something. So it's always nice to have that sort of thrill. Uh, of course, the film's available on a really nice DVD in the uh, Film Noir Classic Collection Volume 1 box set. And of course, that set belongs in every uh, film library, every DVD collection. Uh, if you can manage to find all five of those, uh, you will have some of the crown jewels of Film Noir. Uh, but this is a great one, and Robert Wise was fantastic and had a extraordinary career and could do pretty much every genre known to man. So highly recommended and just another fantastic little RKO classic disc. Lastly on the director's side this is the remastered version of Roman Holiday directed by William Wyler of course. Uh, beautiful looking cover uh, using original imagery. Uh, this was also used for the uh, DVD release. Unfortunately the film has not yet come to Blu-ray which hopefully that will change at some point in the near future. Uh, Pressed and manufactured by Pioneer, so you get their logo here. And around the side you get the remastered indicator. So I think Paramount put this out before on Laserdisc, but uh, I, it was a pretty early release with nothing special. And this adds uh, a digital PCM mono track, which sounds great. Uh, I've sampled this and compared it to the DVD, and it holds up pretty well. It seems like it's the same source transfer for the both of them. Uh, unfortunately, there's no special features, so it's just a nice Laserdisc presentation of the film only. And it's also not too common. I guess it was just one of those where it was reissued kind of later on in the 90s, like some of the other Paramount titles that had that happen, uh, especially the ones that were reissued in widescreen for the first time. And uh, you don't come across it all that often, so highly recommend it. It's of course a great classic film that's beloved by many and uh, just really a nice laser disc and the best way to watch it on the format. Alright next up are the handful of animated discs I've picked up starting with the Disney ones. This is the first cleaned up restored version of Dumbo made available on video. This is the uh, restored version from I think this is from about 1991 or so. Uh, predates the uh, special edition and it's really not exactly essential but I found it for dirt cheap and figured I'd just pick it up to do comparisons because some of these older discs can be almost identical but have some slight variations in color and such. Uh, it does have a PCM track which I believe is stereoized or I'm actually I'm actually not sure it may be mono. I, I think it's probably mono because I think the uh, Masterpiece Collection version is also mono. So this is just a single two-sided disc with no special features or anything, but it is the first time the film was cleaned up and spruced up for home video. And of course has the nice artwork that was pretty much on all the VHS releases. So um, of course it's a fine way to watch the film and I'm gonna have to sit down with this and the Masterpiece Collection version and do any uh, do some comparisons and see if there's any differences and such. So not really essential if you have the other one, but I, like I said, I found it for cheap and I figured why not? I can at least do some comparisons. Next up is the laser disc of Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh. Uh, has a digital Dolby Stereo encoded soundtrack. Uh, unfortunately, there's no CAV version of this. So this uh, laser disc reissue is the best version of the film on laser disc. Nice artwork, uh, pretty much the same thing used on all the tapes. So uh, since I've collected so many Disney discs now, I'm, I guess I'm just going for completion now. And I haven't seen this in ages, but I'm kind of interested to go back and see the Laserdisc version. Uh, it is spread on two sides and yeah, no real special features or anything unless I think it has a little tiny Okay, yeah, it has a tiny making of featurette, so that is at the end. So it's uh, noted here. I think that may have actually been on the t old VHS tape, too, if I'm re remembering correctly. That sounds familiar. 
Uh, of course, the transfer is 133. Uh, a lot of Disney films in the uh, 60s and 70s, there are debates over the intended aspect ratio. Uh, some people swear by 133, some 166, some films have 175 or even 185. So right up until the um, early 80s, there's always a debate for each film and they kind of jump backward and forward in the ratios on disc. So uh, you can look this stuff up online. There are a lot of very detailed animation forum posts and things all over the place trying to nail down which ratio is better for which film. Uh, but you'll have to be careful if you prefer one over another in uh, picking up Laserdisc, DVDs, and Blu-rays because they jump back and forth all the time. But always nice when it's a one and done for a Disney title on Laserdisc. Uh, that being said, this is another Disney title where it's kind of a one and done. This is the Laserdisc of Pete's Dragon, which I don't know if I've seen this since I was extremely little because I don't actually remember seeing the entire thing. So uh, this should be interesting. Uh, of course, this is an older title, seeing as it has the older style of uh, Disney artwork. And of course, this is pretty much sized for tape. Uh, it does have a PCM digital track, stereo encoded. And this is pretty much just a movie only earlier Disney title on disc. It's made on two, well, it runs over onto three sides. So it'll be interesting to check this out. Of course, it is 133. And uh, this is pretty much the only version of Peach Dragon on Laserdisc. So it's another one done, thankfully, on uh, a Disney title because uh, it kind of gets a little old when you have like four or five copies of certain Disney titles. And then you're wondering, what the heck am I doing with my life? I'm not even a Disney fan. <laughs> But anyway, um, I'll be quite interested to give this a spin and actually watch the film and see what the laser transfer looks like. Here is the widescreen reissue of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. I can uh, distinguish it by the red bars on top and bottom and the special edition tag here. Uh, this is a slightly spruced up transfer and adds a Dolby AC3 track in addition to an audio commentary over the older release. Of course, uh, this release is the first time where they snipped out some of the uh, little in gags and uh, naughty frames some of the animators uh, slipped in. So um, this laser disc is actually rarer than the other older letterbox release, which has those frames intact. Um, so it's actually harder to find the special edition with the edits made. Uh, but of course, this version has the commentary and it has Dolby AC3 and a slightly cleaner transfer because I think this came out a couple years later. So this is like a disc from, I think, 96, 97. So um, other than that, the cover artwork is pretty much the same. Still, you know, a single uh, disc with two sides. And uh, the commentary is really the only bonus here. So you're going to want to pick this up if you want the commentary, which is of course also on DVD and Blu-ray. And uh, if you want to check out the uh, Laserdisc AC3 track, which seems pretty much the same. So um, I just, I, I wanted to just compare them. And if I ever found this cheaply, which I finally did, I figured why not? And the transfer is better overall, uh, but you do have to keep in mind, it does have some uh, frames snipped out because uh, you can't have a sense of humor and have anything to do with the Disney Corporation. So, there you go. Moving on to non-Disney animated titles. This is the American Tales sequel, Fievel Goes West, a universal letterbox disc, and uh, unfortunately it's a little dinged up, and I guess it's a X-Store or X-Rental copy because it has these stickers here I've got to try and get off, but um, I haven't seen this since I was a kid, and uh, since I'm a huge uh, Jimmy Stewart fan, this was his uh, final uh, film appearance, of course, in voice only. So I, I had to give it a shot for that alone. The gatefold is pretty good. Unfortunately, this copy got damaged at some point. So the corners are a little bent in and then the center spine has gotten torn. But uh, other than that, the gatefold's pretty darn nice. All the chapter stops are put down here. And here across the gatefold, you have basically the rogues gallery of characters in the film. So that's a nice touch. Again, anytime somebody could use a gatefold, you know, properly in terms of having panoramic imagery, I'm very happy. So 
Uh, I just wish this wasn't this particular copy wasn't so dinged up, but um, now I'm interested to give this a watch, and I'm always curious to see what animation look can look like on Laserdisc, uh, particularly letterboxed animation, because a lot of animated films, of course, were put out on Laser in the 133 versions that were made for TVs of the era. So it's always interesting to see a theatrical widescreen animated film that actually made it to widescreen on disc. Of course, it has a Dolby Surround encoded digital uh, track, which is how it played in theaters. So it should be interesting to uh, check that out because I don't even know if I've ever seen this. So, Speaking of titles that were 133 on disc, this is the MGM UA release of The Secret of Nim, the Don Bluth film. And uh, I think this got some earlier releases. This was the first one to have digital sound, and this is also pretty much the last version. Uh, so you're stuck with 133 on Laserdisc, and if you're wanting the best version of the film, uh, you're just gonna be going for this uh, standard CLV release. It does have the Dolby Surround encoded digital track, which is the original sound mix. Uh, apparently, uh, MGM did some sound remixing on some of the DVDs, and uh, a lot of fans didn't like that because it made some changes here and there. I'm not really familiar all that much with the film, but uh, the Laserdisc and I think the eventual Blu-ray uh, went back and has the original mix uh, if not by itself as an alternate. Uh, but of course the Laserdisc has the original Dolby Stereo. The jacket's pretty nice. And unfortunately there's no special features or anything. And sadly it's not uh, available in a you know full CAV version to really check out all the animation details. But it's, it's a nice looking disc and it replaces the earlier analog only version. So this is the best version available on disc in the States. Next up is my first and only Looney Tunes title on Laserdisc. This is the After Dark compilation. And of course, a lot of people, myself included, really salivate over getting all five of the Looney Tunes Golden Age box sets uh, that have a lot of the uh, classic shorts uh, before the uh, 1990s Turner restorations, which, you know, did a lot of good work, but you know, also standardized a lot of things and made some edits here and there. And going back to the laser discs allow you to see transfers that are a little bit more, um, you know, closer to what the source material was being, you know, pulled off the shelf at that point in time. And uh, there are several compilation discs that were put out on tape and then laser disc as well. And I think it's kind of a mix. Some come from the later Turner uh, 90s restored versions, and then some have some of those untouched shorts from the earlier transfers. And then I think some have a mix of both. Um, but even these compilation laser discs are kind of hard to find. So um, when this popped up and it's still in the shrink wrap and has this really beautiful looking custom artwork, I just, I, I was excited to finally get my first Looney Tunes laser disc. So. I'll show you the rear cover here. Just very, very nicely done. And of course, unfortunately, I just wish they had done all of the uh, Looney Tunes shorts on Laserdisc. Um, like I said, you really have to go for those five um, Golden Age box sets, but those usually go for um, you know pretty much top dollar and go pretty fast. And then the later ones are much harder to find and much more expensive. So. I hope to someday at least be able to check out some of those, but uh, for the time being, this at least gives me a taste of Looney Tunes on Laserdisc and, you know, just underlines the hope that someday maybe we might finally just get a simple, comprehensive Merry Melodies and Looney Tunes release somehow, whether it's Blu-ray from the Warner Archive or whether it's a, uh, a download subscription service or something. You know, it, it, it really needs to happen. I, I know it would be a lot of work, but you know, other things have managed to come to home video and after all this time, I think I think is something that would be worth everyone's while. I don't think it would just, you know, be like the tree that fell over in the forest and nobody would pay attention. Um, so a lot of classic animation is just not properly available in HD and it's, it's really a shame. So um, hopefully, you know, that, that happens at some point. But for the time being, there's the DVDs, there's a couple Blu-ray releases, and then if you're lucky enough to find some of these Looney Tunes laser discs, you can look at some uh, pre-restoration transfers and get more of a, a vintage feel for some of these shorts. So. 
There's that. And then last for animation, uh, this is a tile I've wanted for a long time. And unfortunately, uh, it was a little bit misgraded. It's got a little bit of, uh, of, of a heavy scratch on one side. So it uh, kind of has a defect for about a minute. Uh, but this is the release of Speed Racer the movie from FHE. Uh, this ties in with the cover design of the other two FHE Speed Laser Discs, uh, which were two um, episode releases of uh, two episodes each on two discs. Um, FHE released a number of episodes on VHS tape across 12 volumes. They did about half the series. And then I don't know if they lost the license or just didn't feel like going on, but uh, they only did ha about half the series on tape and then they released two uh, laser discs with four episodes on them, uh, and that was it. So, um, which is unfortunate because the FHE transfers were, um, you know, done straight from uh, U.S. prints and have the original opening and closing credits and no time compression issues and such. So, um, it's really the best way to see. Uh, and a very authentic transfer of the original U.S. prints with the original U.S. opening and closing credits people grew up with. And uh, so you have to go out and track down all of the VHS tapes to see the other ones. But the laser discs are also quite excellent. This laser disc is of the movie compilation, which kind of kick-started a re-interest in speed in the early 90s. Uh, it was a product of Streamline Pictures, and what they did was took... Um, the uh, two-parter episodes, episodes seven and eight, the race against the mammoth car, and uh, put it together for the episode 26, the car hater, and then intersposed various 1960s vintage commercials with a small um, uh, other cartoon segment, which was an episode of Colonel Bleep, which was from, if I'm remembering correctly, from a smaller uh, Florida animation studio. And they basically uh, formed this into about a 90-minute feature that then played in a bunch of art house theaters. And uh, it was the idea was kind of recreating the 60s Saturday morning experience of watching Speed Racer as a kid and also basking in the stylized uh, anime and the stylized violence, but on a big screen and being able to appreciate uh, elements of your childhood as an adult. And of course, this was still long before um, classic animation had a resurgence and was really rarely available on video. And the great thing was that they went and got copies made of the original Japanese 35 millimeter uh, master prints for these specific episodes. So they're brand new transfers of those episodes and they look and sound fantastic. Um, and it's really the, the best those episode, those particular episodes have ever sounded uh, because they went back to the original Japanese materials. Let me show you the rear here. And this is the same rear that was used on the other FHE laser discs. So you can put them side by side and they all look the same. Uh, it has the mono track in digital PCM. And of course for this, they recorded a new 90s kind of techno remix version of the classic Speed Racer theme and played it over the longer Japanese opening credits. And I think that's actually in stereo. So it's that section is stereo and then all of the uh, you know compilation feature is mono. And again, sounds excellent. And the episodes on this disc have far more fidelity in the audio than all the other releases, including the uh, new Blu-ray, because those are from the uh, US mono source. So anyway, it's really nice to have, especially you know if you grew up with this particular compilation, or if you haven't ever seen any Speed Racer at all, it's a great introduction. Or if it's been years or you haven't seen any Speed episodes since your childhood, it's a great reintroduction. Um, that being said, uh, the picture quality is great. It's of course 133 and the sound is excellent. Unfortunately, it has a scuff on site too, so I've got to get a replacement copy. And um, oh, and the other thing I should mention, this was also released on DVD in very limited quantities, but for some reason they cut all of the commercials and the cartoons out and made them extra bonus features you could select from the menu. So the only way to watch the compilation as it was shown in theaters is only on tape and laser disc. So uh, that being said, that does it for the animation section of my new arrivals. Really quick, here is my one horror disc that I've picked up. 
And this is one I've tried to get for a long time. It's an important laser disc to have uh, because the, the DVD of one of the films in this double feature set got messed up. This is the double feature from MGM of the two uh, horror films directed by Michael Curtiz, pretty much back to back, uh, that were shot in two strip Technicolor. Uh, of course, Dr. X and The Mystery of the Wax Museum. Uh, both starring both Fay Ray and Lionel Atwell, both directed by Michael Curtiz over at Warner Brothers. And uh, it was, of course, when two strip Technicolor was really uh, starting to wane because the popularity had worn off and uh, it was really the only times they were used for horror films. And of course, both of these films are pre-code, so they get very dark and they're very well made, but they're also made in the, you know, kind of Warner Brothers house style of the early 30s, so they move very fast. Uh, the main characters are tough-talking city newspaper reporters, um, but they're, they're very important and should be, you know, um, seen for historical purposes. And, uh, you know, for horror films of 1932 and 33, and that they're pre-code, they do have very dark elements. And the two-strip Technicolor makes them really haunting in a way, because uh, two-strip Technicolor itself can be very, very eerie, especially if you haven't seen very much of it before. Of course, the color versions were lost for a long time, so we were stuck with black and white versions. Uh, but they were eventually rediscovered and uh, restored by UCLA. And the Laserdisc was the first time they were released on home video. Let me show you the gatefold. Which is very nicely done. The films run right into the, each other, spread across three sides. And this is another really nice usage of gatefold space. Let me show you the back cover here. Again, nicely stylized with the uh, cover design of the front and the gatefold and it's it's a really nice jacket and this of course was the first time you had a really good presentation of these legendarily rediscovered color versions of two classic pre-code horror films um, ironically for some reason dr x has a black and white still here um, but the reason why this laser disc is important is actually because of the transfers of the two strip technicolor now, of course, these are from the UCLA restorations, and with there only being one surviving print at each, you know it's going to have wear and tear built in, and they were actual release prints that were stored in Jack Warner's archive. And it was only uh, after that archive was opened that uh, they found these in that vault. So if you watch these, you know, it's just a miracle they survived. And uh, you can watch Dr. X on DVD in the Warner Brothers Legends of Horror collection. Um, which has some other really great horror films that were from MGM included. Um, and if you've never seen any of those, I highly recommend it. Um, it's worth it alone for the masterpiece Mad Love that's in there. But anyway, I digress. Uh, if you look at the DVD version, it has a really great commentary and uh, it's a little bit more cleaned up. It's the same source print, uh, but you can see it at DVD quality in 480p. Um, so it looks a tiny bit better and uh, it's the proper two strip Technicolor. But what makes this Laserdisc important is Mystery of the Wax Museum and its transfer. Of course, Wax Museum was later remade uh, 20 years later as the 3D film House of Wax, which is of course what really launched Vincent Price to stardom and forever associated him with horror films. And uh, while House of Wax is a classic and I adore anything Vincent was ever in, um, I do think, and a lot of others will agree with me, that uh, Mystery of the Wax Museum is probably overall the better film. It moves a lot faster. It has a great deal of atmosphere and is extraordinarily creepy in its usage of the two-strip Technicolor and the uh, set design and art direction. Um, it's just it's just a snappier film, and it was kind of both it and Dr. X were not really readily available for a good number of years, so you could only just read about it. Um, and that's not to say that House of Wax doesn't have its its own charms, which it does. It's not exactly a shot-for-shot -shot remake, because some people kind of uh, say that it is, and it isn't. Um, in some ways, it, it, it is stronger in terms of the plotting. Um, 
but they both hold their own. Uh, that's the, I'll, I'll just say that you should any classic horror fan should see both. Uh, but Wax Museum was presented as an extra on the House of Wax DVD, and uh, for some unknown reason, I have no idea why, but when they made that transfer, it's of course from this same single color print that survives, and for some reason, they have changed the nature of Two Strip Technicolor because the uh, pinkish reds and green uh, that Two Strip Technicolor would do has been changed, so the DVD version all the greens are now blue, which of course blue was impossible for two strip Technicolor to produce at all. So it's just a garish looking mess that's completely inaccurate. And um, House of Wax got uh, restored and reissued on 3D Blu-ray. And uh, myself and a bunch of others were really hoping that Wax Museum uh, would get fixed in terms of the transfer and would get an HD transfer, but unfortunately it's just that same standard def uh, DVD included as a bonus extra um, with the same problem where everything that's supposed to be green is blue. Um, so that is one of the biggest technical snafus on, on DVD. Um, it's just as bad as, um, you know, uh, silent films encoded at the wrong speed or wrong frame rate, uh, which there's tons of those on both DVD and Blu-ray. Uh, but this one is so blatant because you can see it and it's technically impossible for Two Strip Technicolor to produce that blue and it just looks really weird. And I, I tried watching the film for the first time that way and it just looks so strange. And I had to actually go and look it up and do some research and thankfully I found some internet articles where people had called attention to that. So the only way to properly watch this film is actually this Laserdisc double feature, which is why I was so eager to track it down. And uh, you will have to spend a little time, uh, you know, it's going to cost probably about, this one goes for about 10 maybe $15 or so. It's not super common, uh, but you don't have to pay outrageous prices for it. But if you want to see the Mystery of the Wax Museum and proper two-strip Technicolor, this is the only way to do it. Um, you can sit there and play around with your TV levels and see if you can adjust the tent, but it really doesn't work. So until somebody at Warner Brothers actually takes the time to correct this, uh, this film is viewable only on Laserdisc because the DVD is awful. I have a couple music discs to add to the shelf. This is the Doors Soft Parade retrospective disc from MCA Universal with a uh, stereo digital PCM track. Interesting shot of Jim against a wall here. Um, this isn't super common. A lot of these Doors laser discs, which there's only a couple, um, of course, some of this, most of this material is on various uh, Doors DVD compilations. But um, of course, anytime, especially in the music realm with video releases, uh, they can go in and remix audio tracks all the time. So, um, and also change aspect ratios and remaster stuff, and maybe not always do it correctly. So, um, there's only a couple Doors laser discs, and they're usually not super common. It's mostly some uh, television live performances and uh, other appearances kind of put into a compilation. So nothing really here is exclusive to this disc, um, but it's nice to see the way it originally showed up and in an untouched 133 laser disc with uh, stereo PCM. So um, I've seen most of these and some of these uh, TV light performances are really, really good. So if you're a Doors fan and you come across this for cheap, it's an absolute must. And uh, I'd seen it several times before for, you know, it goes for quite a bit of money, but I found it locally for dirt cheap, so I figured why not, and then at some point I can compare to some of the uh, archival DVD compilations. Next up is a really difficult to find laser disc that I never expected to see. I just had it on my uh, wish list just because it was the only one this band ever had. This is the Laserdisc release of the Smithereens 10 video compilation uh, pressed by Pioneer. This was a compilation of all of their music videos to date and of course was a play on their uh, then album which was called Eleven which was a reference to Ocean's Eleven hence the uh, cover art design. So um, this was released here in the States and I think it also came out 
I, I think it got a Japanese pressing, but but that was it. And this was the only video release that this band ever had. And uh, it got ported to DVD, which then went out of print super fast. So the DVD version is identical with lossy audio and goes for like $100 on eBay. And the laser disc is super uncommon and there's very few copies floating around. So finding this in a bins was really, really nice because um, if you've never heard of the Smithereens, they're a phenomenal, they were a phenomenal band and uh, really one of the great underrated American bands who never really got the credit they deserved. Um, so I cannot recommend their catalog highly enough. So it's pretty straightforward. It's just uh, 10 music videos with uh, little video intro screens before each, which is kind of nice. It's just like the way you would see uh, video comps back on VHS tape during the day. Back on VHS tape during the day. Um, but unfortunately, the video has a little bit of speckling uh, starting about halfway through. It's not really bad and it's not full on rot or anything. The digital audio track is unaffected, thank goodness. And uh, it kind of goes in and out on the speckling. It, it never becomes unwatchable. Um, of course, had I paid a super high price for this, I would have been a little peeved, but um, considering I never thought I'd find this, I, I, can, I can live with it. Um, and of course, the audio sounds fantastic. And anytime you're looking at music videos, sometimes the audio track mix can be a little bit different or a little bit extended or a little bit shorter as compared to the album release. So it's nice to be able to examine those in uh, PCM stereo. So really nice little um, music laser disc release. Um, it's only one sided. I wish they would have used the other side and allowed the band to put more stuff on here, but you can tell this is pretty much to you know designed to be fit onto like a one hour uh, VHS tape. So it's lucky it even got a uh, laser disc pressing. Next up is the original Warner Home release of the Woodstock film. And of course, this is the theatrical version, not the uh, director's cut that uh, was made in 1994 uh, that is on all of the uh, every release from 1994 onwards. And uh, I picked this up just out of curiosity, just to see, you know, compare the audio mixes, because of course, that's the big thing with everything Woodstock related is, you know, how's the audio mix for all the concerts, um, you know, and uh, how does it compare to the director's cut, which is um, the whole reason why I picked this up. It, it, I just saw it cheap in a seller's posting, and I figured, you know, uh, give it a shot and compare it against the uh, Blu-ray with the uh, additional footage as well. Um, it's really a hard film to sit all the way through because of the excessive length, uh, but it does have a beautiful um, rhythm and power to it due to the phenomenal editing work. And if you've never seen this film, uh, you definitely should, even if you're just a, a music fan, not really a film fan, or vice versa, because uh, it is a time capsulation of you know the entire era in one specific moment. and. Uh, it really, really gives you a better sense of what it was like to have been there as opposed to just reading all about it. And of course, due to the excessive length, it's really best taken perhaps in segments, <laughs> unless you really feel like sitting there and going through the entire thing. So this is just a standard Warner release, standard jacket, and uh, the film is spread across four sides. But again, this is the uh, roughly three hour uh, theatrical version. So if you're wanting to see the theatrical cut and see what that looks like, uh, you can pick this laser disc up. Just do be aware it's not um, widescreen, it's 133, um, which really isn't super bad because all of this was shot on 16 millimeter to begin with. Uh, but of course, later on in the editing, they used uh, triple and quadruple panels of 16 millimeter to create a really epic widescreen image. So you're gonna lose out on that by uh, looking at this particular laser disc. So I'm gonna have to spin this up and check the transfer out and check the audio out. So again, this is really just more to look at the theatrical version and uh, see what the audio track sounds like compared to the uh, director's cut. <clears throat> Next up, we're gonna dig into some of the sequels and series discs and uh, some of my favorite actors and actresses that I already have like a small grouping of. So we're going to start off with 
a uh, I got this along with 2001 the AC3 pressing this is the very difficult to find AC3 final reissue of 2010 Odyssey 2 and it's a really nice jacket it's obviously the original poster artwork and the same as the original release but it's been given a very thick uh, gloss and the letterbox bar on the top is printed dark as to not distract from the cover imagery They've added the Dolby AC3 moniker down here. And then the rear is also super glossy and the same artwork, but here they've added an extra bar saying the next step on the ultimate trip. So that's a, that's a really nice touch. Sometimes I wish MGM had done that more often on their rear covers. Um, again, really nice thick gloss on this. Uh, no special features outside the theatrical trailer and here's the mention of it having Dolby AC3 in addition to the Dolby surround and then of course this was released by Image because it is a pretty late release. So you can pretty much get the original snapper case DVD and get the 5.1 track and the transfer on this disc um, but of course that has a lot of noise and artifacts and stuff because it's a very early DVD. Uh, Warner Brothers finally released the film on Blu-ray and the transfer is of course much improved and looks really nice uh, but I think some people have claimed the audio may have been remixed somewhat. Um, I'm not a super huge expert on 2010. I've never really watched it all that much. I've seen it a couple times and I appreciate things in it, but I'm not enough of an expert to be able to tell you right off the bat uh, what may be different. So I had always thought it'd be interesting to find this, but uh, it's very hard to come by and usually it's pretty expensive. But I got lucky and found a, a listing on eBay that had both 2001 and 2010 in the AC3 version. So um, I'm definitely excited to check this out. The transfer should be really, really good because I'm imagining it being like that DVD without all of the uh, digital noise and early DVD crud that's uh, really inherent in all the very early DVD masters. So um, really nice disc and really impressive cover, even though it's the same as the original, uh, just because the high gloss they put on the printing is so much improved. So really, really nice little disc if you can actually find one. Next up is the Letterboxd release of Back to the Future 2. Um, I've not yet been able to pick up part one and part three, and uh, I always intended to get all three, but they usually are pretty well desired among collectors and uh, people looking for you know good non-altered transfers with the original Dolby Stereo soundtrack so um, just like the Indiana Jones trilogy and Star Wars they usually have a higher dollar amount attached to them um, even though they're just standard pressings so when I saw part two locally for cheap I figured I'd go ahead and pick it up and eventually get one and three later so of course you have the universal usage of original poster art and then their letterboxed edition banner on sort of a sky universe background, which looks pretty good. Although I wish they would have stopped with their little colored bar that dates back to the old Encore days, but that's universal for you. <laughs> you pretty much get used to having that. And then the rear is pretty straightforward looks rather nice although it seems more like an older disc than one of these letterbox discs uh, of course it's just a simple movie only clv disc with a uh, matrix adobe surrounding coded digital track so this is just a nice laser disc uh, without any uh, alterations or anything with the uh, film's original soundtrack and its original format and that's really the reason why you'd want to pick these up for the Back to the Future series. Um, a lot of the later transfers have a, a huge overusage of uh, digital noise reduction and 5.1 remixes that uh, you know some people don't really like. And um, at least when you go back to Laserdisc, you don't have to deal with any of that stuff. And that's really the draw. Um, otherwise, they're just standard letterbox pressings from Universal. So hopefully I can pick up the other two and uh, check those out at some point. But I was happy to at least get one of the three. Now here's a nice little uh, double feature with the Encore Edition banner. This is a double feature of Marlena Dietrich and Blonde Venus and Shanghai Express. Uh, both two of the films that uh, she famously starred in that were directed by Joseph von Sternberg. 
And uh, this is a really, really nice little universal package, very similar to what they did later on with uh, some of the uh, classic horror sequels where they put them out in a encore double feature with uh, digital sound. So of course these will be better than what would have come out before as analog only encore discs. So you get a nice little gatefold with one panel for each film with really nice liner notes, pictures, and then the uh, full chapter stops for each. Um, unfortunately, you're not really going to get any special features. The special features for these are really having a nice package with the films with having decent transfers and digital sound. So, um, of course, before this, you were pretty much stuck with whatever was showing up on tape, if anything. So, this is just a nice little package getting these two films out there. Show you the rear. Like I said, pretty much just like the Encore double features for. Um, I think the one of the pairings was Dracula's Daughter with Ghost of Frankenstein, for example. So um, had this come out earlier, uh, it would have had analog sound or uh, been a single disc for each with analog sound. So um, nice little package of two of the series of films that Sternberg made with uh, Dietrich. So again, I'm a sucker for any classic on Laserdisc. So I'll try virtually anything just to... Uh, see what the laser looks like or do a comparison or sometimes it's nearly as good as having the DVD. Speaking of that, here is another uh, not super common uh, double feature of classic titles, um, but since it's quite rare and I love these films anyway, I figured I'd see what the laser disc looked like. This is a uh, image release of two classic uh, Ealing British comedies. The Lavender Hill Mob, paired with The Man in the White Suit, both starring Alec Guinness, and two wonderful, wonderful, wonderful classic English comedies. And uh, again, just on a simple image banner with the disc background, and then it's nice for them to at least use some original imagery, although I don't really know. I guess the idea is that it's like postcards of the films just kind of laying on a desk or something. Um, but it's still in the shrink wrap and is really, really nice. And like I said, very, very uncommon. I'll show you the rear. Pretty much like all the other image discs, looks more like a, um, a book rear jacket describing the contents of a book instead of a uh, video release. But still really nice of them to get these films out. And uh, I guess HBO had some sort of licensing deal with these because they're credited here with their video logo. And it does have digital mono, so that's another nice touch. It's not an analog-only disc, so I'm going to have to check this out and compare it to the uh, later cleaned-up versions. Next up is a title to fill in a hole in my Errol Flynn collection on Laserdisc. This is the restored version of the Seahawk with the uh, original sepia tone sequences uh, properly placed and uh, this was really the first time that on video you could see the film uncut and uh, properly timed to be black and white with uh, several sequences in sepia tone. Beautiful, gorgeous artwork. Um, I, I guess this is a collage from some original poster imagery, but it's really fantastic and really carries across that this is one of the all-time great adventure films. Uh, just beautiful and of course it shows you here that it is indeed the restored uncut version essentially meaning that it is uh, not cut down for time because uh, I think before this uh, when you would see the film it would be a, run a little shorter and it wouldn't have the uh, sepia toned sequences. Show you the gatefold. A pretty nice one from MGM. No logos or um, text or chapter stops or anything but uh, just a gatefold devoted to imagery from the film, of course, tinted like they usually would, but uh, with, you know, it looks a little bit better than some of their others. And then here is the other side. The green always kind of makes me think of Adventures of Robin Hood and especially the Criterion uh, green packaging for that one. And here's the rear, again with the older style of MGM rear cover having a central design with text images and then the credits along the bottom. So a really nice laser disc release, the first truly good release of the film where it was complete and uh, properly timed. 
and then essentially this source was eventually done on DVD for the uh, Errol Flynn Signature Box Volume 1, uh, which is a great DVD, and now it's just been released by Warner Archive and looks beautiful on Blu-ray. So um, I just wanted to pick this up since I had gotten most of the other Errol Flynn classics on Laserdisc, just to see how it compares and uh, just because I, I, I love this film so much I figured well I might as well have the laser disc too so uh, I cannot recommend this highly enough the the film is one of the great adventure films uh, the corn gold score is absolutely legendary and is worth watching the film for alone um, but if you do go see it you should check out the new Warner archive blu-ray which is absolutely fantastic uh, but if you're looking for the Laserdisc version to get, it's this one. Every uh, earlier version is going to be analog only, missing pieces, and not have the uh, sepia toned sequences. Next up is a, uh, well, it's relatively uncommon. MGM did a couple of these where they brought together some of the classic uh, Catherine Hepburn, Spencer Tracy vehicles. Uh, this has two, Adam's Rib and Patent Mike. Of course, Adam's Rib was released by Criterion earlier on, uh, but really didn't have, it was one of their uh, more movie-only discs. So this was MGM putting it out with a uh, digital mono track and uh, probably slightly a spruced up transfer. Um, that's usually what MGM would do with a um, title that they previously licensed out, licensed out to Criterion. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the Criterion Adam's Rib, um, but I'm sure one day I'll get to compare them. Uh, of course, these films are out on DVD, but I was really excited to find the Laserdisc version because I'm a PC, a mono geek, and uh, it's not not very common. I looked it up on the Laserdisc database, and uh, they didn't put out all of the Tracy Hepburn films because uh, some rights uh, reside at other studios, and. Uh, they put out some earlier on in the analog only era, and then I think they did maybe two or three of these little double feature pairings or reissues. So if you're wanting to find these films on Laserdisc in the best quality, try and find these uh, later MGM versions. The gatefold's pretty nice. Again, with the chapter stops for each on each gatefold panel, and each disc, one disc per film. Even though this partnership still gets mentioned every once in a while, I do think this, this string of films is, is really underrated in this day and age. Um, of course, Warner Brothers finally got the um, rights kind of cleared up so you can actually pick up their uh, uh, Hepburn and Tracy DVD set and it has all of their uh, co-starring films in one package, which is nice. Um, it's, a couple have made it to Blu-ray, um, but unfortunately not all of them. and. Uh, Pretty much most of the uh, DVDs, especially the earlier films that aren't on Blu-ray, are just uh, pretty much ports of what was um, made available first on Laserdisc. So um, I have that DVD set and I've kind of compared it to these and they seem roughly the same. Um, but of course the ones that are available in HD, like uh, Woman of the Year from Criterion, looks absolutely stunning. So again, if you can go for the HD versions, do so, but sometimes it's nice to go back to classics on Laserdisc, um, particularly when you find these really nice, harder to find versions. This is the John Wayne picture, Tall in the Saddle, uh, an image classic release so you get the standard image title and uh, I don't think this one's too common so anytime I'm finding western discs especially ones that you know I've never seen because I haven't seen this one and uh, it's not super common and as long as it's a classic or especially a western that has a digital soundtrack I'm in um, so I'm gonna have to fire this up and check out the transfer on it but it's pretty much just the standard style of um, image jacket and I've been really trying to dig through John Wing's uh, career and see a lot of his more obscure westerns. Of course this was later reissued as part of the big uh, John Wayne RKO films box set that came out much later but um, that one is pretty hard to find and I've actually got a, uh, a copy of that I'm going to go through later so I'll have to compare and contrast these. I picked this up before I've managed to find that box set version but um, Anyway, uh, it's just a nice, 
Image Classic release like all the rest of them, similar packaging and everything. And you know, at least they were getting these titles out there with digital soundtracks. Next up is another Wayne title. This is the universal release of Jet Pilot, uh, which is a 133 opened up transfer with a uh, digital mono track. This is another one that's not super common, and the uh, the artwork looks really, really nice. Uh, let me show you the rear cover. I know this is, uh, it was later put out on DVD and has been put out on Blu-ray, I think over in Europe. Uh, I can't remember if it's Germany or somewhere. And I've seen some of the uh, screen capture comparisons and the HD transfer looks really nice, but it seems like there's a lot of uh, color fluctuation in differing transfers of this film. Um, so again, anytime I see an older classic title that's a rarer laser disc for you know super cheap, I figure why not? I can always just uh, do comparisons later. Uh, but gosh, I don't even I can't even remember the last time I saw this, so I'm gonna have to spin this up and check it out again. Here's another John Wayne title. This is the Warner's letterbox release of Cahill U.S. Marshal. Uh, lovely looking jacket, uses the whole space, no extra logos here and there, just the usual classic LD logo in the bottom corner. Still in the shrink wrap, mostly. And the rear is the standard Warner Brothers rear cover, but it looks quite nice. I like the color choices. And again, you really wouldn't know it's widescreen, but you have to search for the little note here and the little widescreen logo on the side. Uh, it has a digital mono track, so this is just a nice, good letterbox release of this film. And again, really the first one that was actually decent and not pan and scanned. Uh, this film's got a newer transfer on Blu-ray, so at least it fares pretty well in HD. But since I've been looking at some of the other John Wayne films on Laserdisc, uh, this popped up locally, so I figured why not. Now this one was a nice find. This is the remastered widescreen Paramount release of The Shootist, and it's a uh, much later Paramount disc and not super common. Uh, it was ported for the uh, DVD, which I think added like a tiny smattering of extras, and uh, but pretty much it's just the Laserdisc. So um, I've previewed a little bit of it. It's a really nice transfer, of course, with uh, a really great mono track. I'll show you the rear. Nice looking jacket, pretty standard for uh, Paramount at this point in time. Pressed by Pioneer, so you get their logos there. Uh, just a single disc, two sides, no extras, but a really nice transfer and really the first decent disc this film has gotten. Unfortunately, this film has not been released in HD anywhere because studios are stupid. And <laughs> hopefully uh, somebody gets this out there at some point because it is a really, really good picture. And of course, you know, um, really a swan song for Wayne. And of course, you have Jimmy Stewart in there, and it's a Don Siegel picture. So um, I, I think Don Siegel is, is another one of the great underrated American directors. And uh, at least some of his work is getting more respect that it rightfully deserves in the critical establishment at uh, this point in time. So um, hopefully, with that, that prod somebody to say, hey, we should get the shootist out on Blu-ray. But until then, uh, the laser disc is really, really good and the rough equivalent, rough equivalent of the DVD. Last up is the remastered widescreen edition of Young Guns. I have the sequel and I've had it for a couple years, but I wanted to find the original film on Laserdisc, and usually you find the older pan and scan disc. This was done later on in the 90s via live home video and uh, has the film's original Dolby Stereo track as PCM. The rear is pretty straightforward, so really the draw for this is having the widescreen transfer on Laserdisc that's a new transfer, much better than the older one. And uh, the various DVDs and Blu-rays of this film are really crummy. Uh, the current Blu-ray is really bad and has some audio remixes that aren't very good. It's, got, it's an old transfer with a lot of DNR, digital noise reduction, just looks really gross. Um, so there's not really a good uh, HD transfer out there. Uh, most of the DVDs aren't that good either. So I wanted to check down this laser disc with the film's original mix to then have a double feature with the second film. Um, of course, ironically, the second film, uh, the DVD was a port of that laser disc. 
And uh, finally, this past year, Warner Brothers put out a Blu-ray of Young Guns 2, which looks and sounds excellent. So now the sequel finally has a good Blu-ray and the first film does not. So um, if you're wanting this film on Laserdisc, you'll have to look for this one, but it can be very, very elusive. It eluded me for a good number of years, and I know some other people have had trouble trying to find it. So that's going to do it for this segment of the new editions. Um, I'm going to put together some more videos of the other discs that have accumulated since I started this video series. Uh, I find by breaking it up into pieces, it uh, keeps it from getting 25 hours long. So uh, thanks very much for watching, and stay tuned for more updates.